Hi everyone, welcome to the Vin and Ali show. This is a different episode. This episode we're doing what's called a chin wag. This is chin wag number two, Ali. This is the second Ooh. chin wag we've ever done. Cool. The sequel <laughs> will it be better than the original. I don't know because the last time we did a chin wag was pretty fun. And <laughs> I, I guess for our new listeners, what this is, is just an episode where Ali and I get to jump on and talk about the things that are on our minds. And also we will engage in social media to see if there are any questions you want us to answer as well. So I put out yep. a post last night on Instagram, I got a bunch of questions that we can go through. Where do we want to start, Ali? I mean, there's oh. a lot of great questions. There's a lot of terrible questions. I mean, what, what do we do? <laughs> do we do we speak about what's on our mind first? All right, let's let yeah. Well, it's our chin wag, right? So we can freestyle. We're, we're obviously too lazy to read a book, so now we've got this opportunity for a couple of hours <laughs> to go <laughs> wherever we want. Um, you pick one. Okay. Well, I think I want to start with what's on my mind first. Okay. Now it's been a minute since we've done the last podcast. The last mm. one we did was five love languages. I would love to get an update from you. What's what's one of the highlights that has happened in your life in the last, I would say, three months, two months? Yep. And what did you take from that highlight? I mean, what was it for you? Did you learn anything? Did you have any experiences that that was profound in any way? It doesn't even have to be profound. Was there anything that kind of came up for you in the last two months? Uh, well, I think one of the the big highlights that I had over the last couple of months was... Um, being able to head off to Europe. So mm. got had a couple of week trip over there. One of the dreams, like especially if you're into golf and it's a big bucket list item is to go over and see the British Open, which is one of the big golf tournaments that exists in the world. And that's been on the list for about 10 years and was finally, and after pandemics and all the other bits and pieces, uh, was finally able to head over there with a couple of really good friends Got to meet a couple of new friends and yeah, that was just a blast. And on top of that, an Australian camp Smith ended up winning the tournament while we were pretty much on the, on the fairways. So that was very, very cool to experience that. Now, was it profound? I don't know about that. It was fun. It was awesome. It was really cool just to sort of get away. Like obviously, as you know, this year, probably been a little bit of a roller coaster in a few different ways. So it was just nice just to have that time, go on a little adventure and I'm just somebody that loves different environments and trying all those things. So that, that was quite an epic experience and just one that, yeah, really enjoyed. Um, I mean, so that was I, I, me. I remember you, you saying to me that, didn't you realize how important travel was for you? I mean, yeah, think about the last few years, you've had really no travel and then being able to do it again, doesn't that kind of show you how important it was to you? Yeah, and, and I think it's it's it even feels weird like talking about it. like obviously travel like first of all I think the big feeling that I got while over there was this gratitude you know like gratitude that Chantal was at home looking after the kids and yeah, essentially allowing me that opportunity gratitude that you know I could go away for a couple of weeks and we've got an amazing team that are able to look after the business and keep those things ticking over so like if I think about that like it was you know a very it's very much a first world privilege and benefit you know to have an experience like that so just acknowledging that um how cool it was to be able to experience that but then also yeah i guess one of my values is environments and changing up those environments exploring a bit of adventure so it was nice to kind of align with that and having the opportunity to do so after we have had a couple of years where travel has been pretty limited and and you could tell even while we were traveling around that the, it was busy and the airports weren't really ready for it. The airlines weren't really ready for it. The, the venues that you're going to, like everything's still kind of rebounding, but that was really cool. So, did you feel, did you feel refreshed after coming back? Do you, oh, did you feel rejuvenated? So, so refreshed and rejuvenated, you know, it's one of those things where, and I think it's, you know, I think we spoke about it on one of the previous podcasts. Like when you do change your environment up, when you take some time away to, to do something that you like, whether that's travel or reading a book or whatever it is. I think there is always an element there where it does rejuvenate you. It resets you. Generally, it gets you appreciating the things in your daily life that you sometimes take for granted. So there are some benefits in that. But it's, it's very hard also to take that time away and to, to do those things, which I also understand. So it, it's finding that balance, but sometimes 
removing yourself from the daily grind, call it, or the day-to-day, if you're feeling a little bit stuck in that, it can be something mm. that does re-energize and rejuvenate you. It's just a bit of a reset. I mean, the first trip away after such a long time, was it easy to disconnect? Did you, <laughs> were, you, were you still worrying about things from your everyday life or were you able to disconnect? Uh, a little bit of a mixture. Like I think going into it, there was a bit there where like, say if I look at my last six to eight months, mm. it hasn't felt like a steady stream where it's just sort of like on a, on a predictable trajectory. It's felt more like a lot of big things, ups, downs, ups, downs that have been going on. So mm. I don't think it was as easy just to get into that zone of just, all right, pack yeah. the bags and off we go. But once I was sort of there and then you're in that moment, I think automatically you end up just in that zone just because of the time difference, time zones, um, the change in, yeah, that environment being in a different country, you know, new experiences, whatever it is, you end up getting into a little bit of a routine. So, um, yeah, I think it probably started not as smooth as probably normal, but then, yeah, got into that flow pretty quickly. Oh, that's awesome. Because I, 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 this year, I, you went to the UK, right? So I yeah. was actually in Germany. Yeah. So I went to Berlin in Germany and I actually found it really hard to switch off. So I was away for about a week and it was just difficult yeah. to switch off because I guess when you have your phone with you and you, you take it with you, your life kind of comes with you, right? Yeah. It's, everyone is still able to access you emails still come through and I think yeah that I just found it still a little bit hard I, I mean it was still great it was just a little bit hard to disconnect yeah. We're, we're, yeah. We'll, I want to go back and unpack your trip as well but one of the things that was hilarious we went to a comedy show the other day we watched Chris Rock and one of the things with the comedy show was that you had to put your phone in the bag so they give you these lock up oh. bags for like two or three hours so essentially wow. there's five I don't know how many thousand people there five six thousand people there no phones so like you're just Wait, watching so they everyone. Up five thousand phones. Yes, yeah, so before you enter the venue, you have to put your phone Whoa. into a bag, and you're there for what three hours or so. And there was just this interesting dynamic with everyone there. Potentially, mm. like for me, I think that was the first time I would have been awake for three hours without touching my phone. And I reckon that might have been pretty similar for most of the people in there. And like mm. people like making eye contact. <laughs> small conversations going on they're looking Big around human. like people are trying to look at like somebody that had a watch on to see what time it is because no one really knew when the show was going to start like there are all just these little intricacies but like you could see just a variety of people like a either enjoying themselves being a little bit more present in the moment or even mm. i think some people are probably like stressing out a little bit because just the yeah. discomfort of not having it but i think that happens now even mm. with travel you end up in a zone where you're either yeah checking something or you're taking a photo or I better better record this, mm. you know, better capture this moment. And yeah, it is sometimes more difficult to get into those zones. But yeah, what about, so you were over there in Berlin. How was that experience? I know you have, no, like as a keynote speaker, you've been sort of doing a lot of your stuff virtually. And was that one of your, was that one of your first gigs overseas in how long? Three years, two, two and a bit yeah, years. Wow. The first overseas gig in, in about two years, yeah. And, well, I mean, it, it reminded me of how much I loved traveling. Mm. And it was weird because I never, I, I guess I did it so much in my previous life. I, I, I used to do, oh, man, I used to be on the road about 180 days a year. It was disgusting. And that made me hate the process of traveling, being on a plane, being in airports. I hated all of that so much towards the end of 2019. And then obviously that got taken away from all of us globally. And then in doing that again, I didn't realize how much I missed the process of traveling, you know, going to the airport, getting a cup of coffee, waiting for the plane to arrive, getting on the plane, sitting on the plane for bloody 16 hours. Yeah. I, I didn't realize how much I missed that. And it's funny you talked about the Chris Rock people putting their phones in a bag. Yeah. The plane is the one place where I couldn't, like my phone, the only thing I could really do on my phone was look through my photo reels, which was really nice. Yeah. I loved going through the photos and seeing the year that has passed so far. And I just loved Ooh, that. Oh, I like escape. that. Wait, wait, wait. Before you, before you continue yeah. on there, when you were going through the photo reels, was there any moments that stood out? Lots of camping. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I, have, I have all these... 
I have all these memories and pictures of Xander and I in the same jackets that we got, you know, because when we go camping, we have these specific jackets that we wear. And it's just so many memories of us exploring, going on hikes, making fires, cooking food. Overwhelming number of photos in my photo album was us going camping and, and going on road trips. That's cool. Memorable but moments, I, looking back over Memorable them. moments. But I, yep. but I didn't realize how much I missed that process because if, if you ask me what I do on the plane, I'd love to ask what you do on the plane because yeah. you sat on a many yeah. hour flight as well, multiple hours. When I sit on the plane, it's either going to be watching a movie, reading, looking at photos, or sometimes I try to write a little, right? Mm. So I try to write a little, reflect, and I guess I fell off the bandwagon doing a lot of those things. I've, when I looked at my last journal that I took, the last time I journaled was in March, the 2nd of March this year. Yeah. And I, I fell off, I fell off the, the bandwagon. I fell off the journaling bandwagon. Only started again about like a week ago. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the plane made me realize that I need to start doing that again. And I, I just, I haven't reflect, I, I didn't reflect. I didn't look back at what I was doing. I, I didn't really have, I guess, a steering wheel. I feel like the journal is a bit of a steering wheel for me. It allows me to steer my life a little more intentionally. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was, that was something that I, I took away from traveling again. Is it, it, it just made me reflect on my life and go, man, you used to journal frequently and, and it, it really helped you get your thoughts out, gain clarity. And then you stopped. And when I was reflecting on the plane and I wrote again, the reason why I stopped for so long was because I was being super hard on myself for falling off the horse. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's, isn't it weird that you beat yourself up for, Oh man, I, I should have journaled more. And then I didn't, <laughs> I'm not going to journal anymore. Stuff it. I've totally failed. And I just spent a lot of time thinking about that going far out. It's not about not falling off the horse. It's about learning how to get back on the yeah. horse faster. Whereas I took like a three month period off the horse, you know? Yeah. That's a really interesting concept just with when you have a streak going and then you yeah. break it, how your brain automatically tells you, Hey, we should just never do this again. We should just, uh, it's yes. Like, <laughs> It's like, like, and it's always with the really so bad important stuff sometimes it just becomes part of it like i think the gym is probably a pretty good example it's like a pretty good like, example <laughs> <laughs> it's like you go four or five weeks three times yeah. a week then you miss one session and you're like do you know what i think nah, we should just never just ever go it. again <laughs> like <laughs> that was cool why does the last brain do that <laughs> yeah no and you really, it's hard to trick it against it until you have a moment like that. Like for you, you had to hop on a plane and then you're like, hey, remember that thing I used to do that I did for ages? It was really good. It's like, ah, now. And then and then the brain's like, hey, yeah, why don't we, why don't we start another streak? We should get another streak going. This is, this is great. But well, it, <laughs> that's it, it just made, it just made, well, that, that, that's the thing, right? It just yeah. made me realize that it, we're all human. I mean, how many yeah. people are there out there in the world that can say that they stay on the horse a hundred percent of the time. I, I don't think that's what it's about. I mean, I wrote about it this morning. I just wrote, I don't think it's about never falling off the horse. I think it's about just not beating yourself up when you fall off the horse to the point where you resent that very horse and then you never end up getting back on it. it it's so strange how the brain does that, man. It's so strange. And maybe there is something there that a break is sometimes good. You know, yeah. like if you do something that was very nourishing mm. for a very long period of time and it starts, because I think that could be another part of what we do is that we're like, okay, well, is this now becoming more of a chore because I'm mm. on this streak or is it still giving me the benefit that I wanted from this activity or this habit? And mm. then when you have that little break, it just gives that separation potentially where you're like, okay, well, that was awesome. I've had a little break. I miss it now. Now I'm mm. back in and I don't have to punish myself on whether I continue this streak or, uh, you know, tick off the box that I did my journaling today or whatever it is. Because I think that can also happen with some habits where like deep down mm. you're like, oh, I don't even really want to do this thing, but I better just tick it off. And I, don't, I think it's that balance between, yeah, pushing through if it's a habit that really does nourish you versus sometimes just separating from it and then rejoining. Um, 
when the time is right. But very cool. I think that's a really good point. I think that's a really good point because think, things after a while, when you do the same thing all the time, it does become yeah, yeah a little monotonous and bland. Uh, yeah. But I have to tell you, I mean, as I started doing this again and started journaling again, far out, it's 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 felt great again. Cool. And and I think I think there are some things in life where you can give yourself that permission to be less disciplined. But there are some things where I think you shouldn't as well, right? Because it's not as clear cut as always be disciplined and always you know, give yourself lots of freedom. I think journaling is one of those things where you, you've probably got to stay fairly disciplined. Yeah. Because I, I, I don't think that time off, and just to you know be quite transparent and honest here, in that I don't think me taking those three months off did me any good. Mm. I don't think it did. Yeah. And, and, and the reason why I fell off it was just because, I mean, you know this, we, we use that war analogy all the time. Yeah. I kind of went into a deep mission <laughs> where there was a period of six to eight weeks where I was gone to the world. I was just kind of deep in my own zone working. I still think that during that period, if I continued to journal, I probably would have learned a lot of things. I probably would have built more self-awareness during that time. And now when I look back to that kind of eight week period plus where I didn't journal, I probably, it, it was probably quite stressful. Mm. I think it was more stressful than it needed to be because I was carrying more things in my head as opposed to the habit of me kind of dumping it into my journal normally. Yeah. You know, it, it felt heavier going through it. It felt harder going through those eight to 12 weeks because I didn't. Well, it's just cool self-reflection. Right. Yeah. Because maybe, mm. and that is learning ultimately, because you're going to have another mission like that probably yeah. in the next few months. And mm. that'll be a cool thing to kind of split test it and be like, okay, this next mission, journaling yeah. might be the habit Journal that you take in. Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. you have, in, in the last mission, yeah. did you mm. have any habits or did you try anything different throughout? Because you did have a pretty big stint yeah. there where you're going relatively hard. What was, what were the what were a couple of things that were your releases during that period? Anything I did differently, I, yeah. I mean, man, I went pretty crazy. I I remember I was <laughs> doing an in person workshop right after I finished the, the in person workshop. Then I did a virtual workshop for Zoom. Right after did that virtual workshop, which went for a whole week. Jumped on a plane, immediately flew to Berlin, and then while I was in Berlin got back to Australia, got COVID bloody on the way, got back here, did another in-person thing, somehow survived it, and then immediately went on the road and, and did a bunch of keynotes. It was just insane. Yeah. It was insane. And and while on top of doing that, trying to manage, you know, growing the social media side of things, which, which you know, the team has been able to do really well in, in the last three mm. to four months. So it was just all happening. And I think, I use the excuse of it being too busy and I stopped doing this. Yeah. I, I don't think I did anything besides heads down, bum up and just yep. work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I guess the only thing I did differently in the last three to four weeks was I, instead of just working, I took the family with me and we did kind of a half work, half holiday. Oh, that's cool. You know, and, 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 and then that was great. I mean, that was fantastic because it, it didn't feel so intense. It was just, you know, a keynote, a workshop, interstate, followed by a couple of days of holiday with the family, another keynote, another workshop. So that mm -hmm. it, it felt it felt nice. It felt like you. It, it didn't even really feel like work, to be honest. It mm -hmm. felt like a bit of a vacation. Oh, well, well, congrats on getting through the mission, and then also having yeah. that. Yeah, rest time. Well, there we go. There, there's our recap on the on the last couple of months. <laughs> yeah. L this is why we haven't been doing too many podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> we've, been, we've been away and I think we've been, yeah, I guess practicing a little bit of what we try to preach too, right? Where it's going yeah. to work stints, detach a little bit, take some time away. Um, we've obviously got our different styles of how we do that. But I guess for any listeners out there, if you're feeling a little bit stuck or in a little bit of a rut or you need to change it up a bit, you know, obviously travel is quite an extreme experience and it's not viable for everyone depending on your circumstance, but find your things, whether it's going for a walk or it's reading a book or it's journaling, but having having a couple of those menu items that just allow mm. you to detach a little bit 
and allocating, you know, purposeful time for those things. So I think that's the real big thing is scheduling them in and either forming that as a habit or just blocking out a few hours here and there to, to go and do what, yeah, nourishes you a little bit. I reckon the key, key takeaway there is just change of environment, the importance of changing the environment. And, and the more different the environment or, or, or the more you're able to change up the environment or the more drastic the, the differences in the environment, sometimes you get really drastic lessons that, that get thrown your way, right? It's while, while I was in the, the, the thick of it, I really didn't remember the value of journaling at all while I was in the thick of that work period. And it, it took throwing me on a plane and being halfway across the world for me to go, oh yeah, that, I need to go back to doing that thing I used to yeah. do, right? It, it's, it's the environmental change. It's, it's so powerful. Even, even again, we used to go for family walks and we stopped doing the family walks. And last night we just kind of started that again because I, I kind of went and said to, to my wife, Pei Wen, I said, what are the things we used to do that were really good for us? We need to start doing some of the, them again. You know, it's, it's yeah. So again, whether you're going for a walk change of environment or go halfway across the world, it's, yep. it's good for you. I like it. Yeah. Well, sticking right, on this well, theme, yeah, okay. I've, got, I've got a follow on and okay. I think it probably links to one of the questions that we got or that you got through when you did the call out. Yeah. And like we've spoken a little bit about environment, a little bit about habits, right? Mm. I want to touch on people and relationships, right? So I think one of the yeah. questions was like, how do you find friends? How do you find people? And, mm. and I think we've spoken about this a few times too around, you know, nourishing people, finding your top five and finding people that are interesting or inspiring or that you can learn from or have fun with or that energize you. Where are you at at the moment with that? Any thoughts? Do you have any processes? Are you, are you finding people at the moment that you want to spend more time with? Or, Well, you know what's interesting? It's, let's face it, right? I think as adults, it's very difficult to make friends. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but I just think it, as an adult, we tend to stick to the same friendship groups for extended periods of time. And then as a result, you, you haven't really sharpened the skill of being able to make new friends. And then sometimes it's very difficult to make new friends. And it's funny you ask me this today because yesterday I was on a call with uh, two young guys, one, well, young guys, you know, they're in their early thirties. We were in our mid thirties. <laughs> one of those names. Two years, they're, they're two years, years younger than you. No, no, not two, <laughs> you're, not two. You're, they're, you're about, right. they're about five years younger than me. So five like years these, younger than These me, kids, okay? these whippersnappers. Yeah. Yeah. So yesterday I was having a chat with these two toddlers. Are. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, but but again, it just like I, I don't know why I feel older these days. But I I had a chat with these two guys. One of them was yeah. named Davey and the other one's named Ken, both from from Sydney. Yeah. And we're on an hour phone call together. And I remember them at the start, I asked them, so you know, what what did you both want to get out of this call with me? Mm. And they said, We just want to be friends. <laughs> You know, and it was it was really it was really strange phone call. But then, <laughs> as we progressed on the phone call, I felt the same thing because I felt yeah. really connected to these two guys. And and as we started to talk more, and they shared more about who they are and their vision and their purpose in their lives, I was like, wow, this is so awesome because it's so aligned with a huge part of me and what I want to do. And at the end of the phone call, I kind of said to them, hey, let's do this again. I I want to get to know you both more, and I I actually want to become friends with you both. Yeah. You know, and we, we exchanged numbers and, and it just felt very organic and it felt really like I've, I even sent them a picture. I'm like, guys, I, I journaled about you both today. Yeah. I wrote how, how good it felt to, to make a new connection with mm -hmm. people that inspire me, but then also are extremely aligned with me and, and, and some of the things I want to do in life. Yep. You know, so, so on the topic you, you said about friendships, it's, it's important, I think, to, to make room for new friendships as we grow older in life. Because with new friendships come, it's new energy, it's, mm. uh, it, it, it's, it's new ideas, it's new ways of thinking, it's different visions. Because I, I had a certain way of thinking on the call. I had a certain way of thinking about how I wanted to contribute to the community and, and have impact. 
and then Can shared his ideas of it, which kind of changed my way of thinking about it. And I thought, wow, if I didn't have this conversation, I wouldn't have thought about doing things differently. You know, yeah. and 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 think about think about this as an adult. How often do we make new friends? Hmm. You know, it, it's it's so rare. It's just so yeah. rare. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's a. I was nearly trying to think about it as a bit of a mix, like mm. because you know I like a little bit of structure and process and stuff like that to things. I'm mm. like, okay, well, if you think about it, like what's what's nearly the post thirty year old version of managing relationships and friendships, and <laughs> what should that mix look like? Because you've obviously got people, you know, you've got your long term relationships, which yeah. I think they have like this level of depth. Like if I think about friends of mine that I've now known for over 20 years. Like that's not friends anymore. That's family. Yeah. Right? Like it's more that's like, true. you know, it, it's a different type of relationship. So in terms of like when we now hang out, it's more even just being just together. It's not about mm. even what we talk about. There's a different level of just like comfort, you know, safety, like mm. reminiscing on when, on the past, like you get all the, you get these beautiful things, right? Like these are the people that are going to be there when like the shit really hits the fan. You know that you've got your family there. They're going to support you. But in terms of what you were saying there, like in terms of like call it, it's probably like marriage is another great example there as well. Like that real, like new insight and that sort of like what you got from your call yesterday, you, it's probably going to like the reality is it's going to be harder to find those things from those mm. longer term relationships because you've probably extracted all of that already over a mm. 5, 10, 15, 20 year period. So then I'm thinking, okay, there's, there's like this long term relationship bucket. And then it's like you nearly need to, this is what I was feeling anyway. It's like opening up 5, 10% of relationship bucket or whatever for these new, new relationships. But mm. what I think, what I found is a natural thing is with the newer relationships, the barrier of entry is usually so much higher. Like it's like we put up these walls that weren't the same as when we were 15, 18, 20 years old, where it's like, okay, well, if I'm going to become, if we're going to take this relationship to the next level at the age of 30, it's got to tick 15 of these boxes to warrant time, energy, and Good all point. the other bits and pieces. And then it's like, okay, door closed. It's like, you said that one thing that I didn't really like. Like, I've got my crew. <laughs> That's fine. I'm happy to stay with that. And then you probably do miss out on all of those, yeah, new, new experiences, new ideas, new thoughts. So, yeah, I think finding that that balance is really interesting around that. But that's one of the things that I've been focusing a bit, especially this year, is mm. trying to nurture some some new relationships. And it's been pretty cool. Like, you do get just different energies, different conversations, different perspective, different experiences. And then also what they bring, their networks, like it it unlocks a, like new worlds essentially, which is good. And then ways to do that because then I think the follow-up question is, okay, well, how do you then do that once you're in your 30s? And I think the big one is using some of your passions and then finding communities that associate, that relate to those. I think that's one way, yeah. like joining a club, mm. finding a hobby, joining a class. That just seems like a really cool and easy way um, to unlock some of these new relationships because you can you can build a friendship around that common interest. Mm. And then if you are a little bit more selective, you can kind of pick and choose a little bit knowing that there's going to be some sort of value alignment just based on the fact that you're all there as, call it 30-year-olds, um, trying to experience this thing that you all love. So that might be one easy way, I think. I don't know. Travel is probably a pretty good one. Um, just because when you're sitting there waiting in an airport for three hours, there's plenty of opportunities to start some small talk and conversations. Um, work, networking. I don't know. What about you? Any thoughts? Yeah. I mean, while, while you're talking about that, it just made me think about the family bucket as well, right? Yeah. It's, it's how do you maintain that relationship and yep. how do you keep it you know, how do you make sure it's it's going to continue to thrive? Because I think I'm thinking about, you know, some of my friends that I've known for more than 20 years. You know, for example, one of my one of my best friends in my life, his name's Lenny. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to allow those friendships to just fall onto autopilot, right? Yeah. Where you you lose touch with some of these friends gradually. And 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 some friends, some friendships, they naturally just kind of start to fade away. Whereas the ones that I think are very important to us, one of the ways to keep it going is to grow together, 
right? Because like you said, you, once, you know, once you've known someone for more than 20 years, I kind of know everything about you. You know everything about me too. So instead of finding out about each other, which we, we're not going to be doing, we grow together. Yep. So one of the things yeah. Lenny and I kind of said, and we, we called it out with each other too, is we just kind of said, hey, uh, you know, you're one of my best mates in my life. I don't see you as often anymore. I miss you. How about we just sign up to a, a gym halfway between my house and your house and let's just go once a week together. And that's what we did. We just signed up to a local gym halfway between my house and his house and we just go once a week together. And it's, I have to tell you that that alone has revitalized the friendship immensely. Because instead of just thinking, oh, what's this? What are you going to give me? What am I going to give you? It's kind of, hey, well, let's grow together. It, it, it's an awesome, instead of thinking of it as an exchange of value, it's more kind of, we, we create value together moving forward by growing together. I love that. Yeah. You know, and, cool. and it's just a really cool way to think of when you think of the friendship bucket, how can you kind of maintain that? That's one of the ways. Yeah. How can we grow together? I really like what you said there as well. Like just finding something that's that's nearly structured for you to attend. So you're yeah. going to the gym once a week. It just reminds me of something yeah. that me and a couple of my really good friends are doing, Tom and Joyce at the moment. We're, we're doing these things where it's called a basketball card break. So mm -hmm. Tom's brother runs these and then we log in and he opens packs of basketball cards. We get <laughs> given random teams and then we sit there for like one or two hours and just like little kids again you know, sitting there opening cards and, oh, you got that player, you got that player, like how good's that card? And then just geeking out wow. like over basketball awesome. cards. And, but it's such a cool way like to connect mm. because if we we're like, all right, we're, we're going to go for dinner or we'll, we'll organize something that's a little bit more, you know, physical, like this is online. It's on a Sunday night when the kids <laughs> are in bed. We, we could do it super easy, but it just provides us that opportunity to hang out for a couple of hours, which is cool. So it's nearly finding these activity types to mm. rejuvenate, refresh, and yeah, grow the relationship, I guess, which is pretty cool. There you go. Yeah, and, 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 and you're cool so right life. in thinking of a, I mean, thinking of some kind of structure, right? Because yeah. you, you need those relationships. It, you know, if, if I was to no longer be connected to any of my friends anymore that I've known for more than 20 years, it's almost like you lose a part of who you are. It, yeah. It's so important, I feel. I don't know why this yeah. is so, and it'll be interesting to kind of dig into this. Why do you think it's important to know people who knew you when you were young? Mm. Uh, I feel like one of the reasons why it's important to know people who knew you when you were young is they have context on who you were before you've become the person that you are today. You know, it, it's like they know the, the, the whole you, whereas when you only know people who, who've met you now, again, that they only know the me now. They, they don't know the trials and tribulations that I have had to go through to become the person that I am. Yeah. And there's something really comforting and nice about the people who have known you the whole way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, the, they've just been there for a greater part of the movie. Yeah. Well, like if you think about it. They've seen like all they've the seen, series. They've seen all the they've seasons. Seen, they've seen every yeah. season. They've, they've seen every following. season. Yeah. And, and they've been in it. They've been in a lot of the seasons, right? Yeah. Like it's yeah. A, yeah. Um, that's a good and then you, yeah, that's probably a pretty cool way of looking at it. And then maybe what we're talking about is when when you need when the new characters come in to develop new storylines, right? Which mm. is also important to keep the show fresh. Yeah. Uh, and then you integrate that with with the main cast, mm. the, the original group. So yeah, I think friendship and relationships are very interesting. And, and I, I know we had a few questions there for from people that were also younger. And I think that's just one of, like if you can find a good group of humans to surround yourself mm. when you're so in the important. ages of between like 15 and 20, it's going to, it just might be the greatest return on investment you'll ever get out of anything. Like if you can nurture I, that in those four years. Argue I'd argue not just 15 and 20, man. I, I, I'd say from teenage years up until your late 20s, yeah. it's so critical. That, you know, say between 15 and 30, so important the people you have around you because, yeah. I, again, I mean, a, a story that I share quite often is that I, I spent a lot of time with people who are closed-minded as to what's possible in this life, right? So if you spend time with a whole bunch of people who only believe in, 
becoming an accountant, a doctor, a lawyer, a pharmacist, an engineer, if you only spend time with those people, then that's the only possible future you can see, those five options. You can't yeah. see anything else. Mm. Right? It's, it's, it's the whole idea of whatever the people around you think is possible for them, you think is possible for you. And whatever those people around you think it's impossible for them, you think is impossible for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. true. And just as you were saying that, I think sort of off topic, but I think one of the other things is like, say, say if you had a really great relationship and then mm. something happened and that, you know, it might've been an event or a fight or something like that. I actually think that if you can look past that, there's great benefit even five, 10, 15 years later in going back and nearly seeing, is there a way now, like has enough time passed from whatever mm. that situation was to actually go and see if what you can rediscover what the good was in that. Because I think that's the other thing that I just see with so many people, like with relationships, like some event will happen and then all of a mm. sudden they'll be like, you know what? No, it's over. And just the way my brain works, I'm like, yeah, but that's like, if you look at the whole thing, there's a hundred percent of a relationship. You're mm. fixating on like 1% of yeah. it and completely yeah. amplifying it when there might've been 99% of that relationship that were actually pretty incredible. Mm. And, and you see that, right? Like often obviously in romantic relationships where it's like they were together for 16 years, big fight, big incident, whatever it's over gone. And it's mm. like, well, kind of, but I just don't think relationships can be erased like that. Like it's very hard when there was something special there to just ignore that, it wasn't, you know, special, never existed, and then it's over. I don't know. I think the, we do funny things with relationships. That well, because because be the closer to, people get to us, the, the closer people get to us, the we give them the power to hurt us the most. The, the closer someone is to us, the more they can hurt us. And I, I feel that that pain that they can they can inflict on us is so painful in the moment that you forget about everything else, you know? It's like a, the, the Mike Tyson thing. Well, you have a plan until you get punched in the face, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's when the people all around you, they've done all these good things for you, but in, in one moment, it can all fall apart because it's so painful in that moment. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, but, but I think that's interesting that you reflect in that way because one of the questions we got was, and it's funny that this person asked this because... It just makes me feel like an egotistical maniac. But they, they say to us, they ask us, why do you think you guys are so successful? What attributes do you think have helped you achieve what you have? I love it. Because when I read that, I couldn't, I couldn't help it but laugh and going, oh, we're so successful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. But I mean, <laughs> the, the core part of that is what attributes do you think have helped you achieve what you have? And what you just spoke yeah. about there is I think very high levels of emotional intelligence. I think you've got very high levels of EQ. And mm. it's interesting because I think you and I, I don't think we'll get a very high IQ score. So if we went down and we went for an IQ test, I, mm. I think people would be shocked at the score that you and I would be able to get. Well, mine would be higher than yours, but yeah, that'd be still <laughs> That'd be <laughs> still be low. But. I, you know what? You know what? Why don't we both do one? Oh, I no. think we should both do one and let's see who gets the high IQ score because I know mine would be higher than yours. <laughs> and, It'd and be one of those the reason we're both vulnerability laughing. episodes after it and it could could be career enders for us both. It's like these guys are goldfish. No, but, <laughs> but that's the thing. I mean, I, I think the important thing to realize yeah. here is that they, they've they've done a lot of research to understand that EQ is a better predictor of success than IQ, For sure. right? And and I, I actually I wrote it down the other day. Let me see if I can quickly find it. Um, the the definition of EQ, and I, I love this definition because it's so clear cut. And the definition is uh, the ability to monitor one's own emotions and the emotions of others, and to discriminate among them, and then use the information to guide one's thinking and actions moving forward, right? And again, the ability to monitor one's own emotions and the emotions of others. And I, I, I feel that that's such a critical ingredient if you want to succeed. I mean, look at what you were able to do before. You were able to look at, obviously, an example you were thinking of in your own mind of someone that potentially has 
you know, in a way crossed you and, and, and did something bad. And you were able to look back at that relationship and go, you know what, it's, there's so much more there than that kind of moment of pain. There was so much more of it. And I, I think it's just a great example of great levels of emotional intelligence. Mm. Yep. So I like this topic. So in terms of mm. EQ, because I know you, you definitely operate in this world. Like I think communication is <laughs> the outward expression of high levels of EQ. Mm. How, how do you develop EQ? Well, from a communication it, standpoint. Like, is it natural? Can you learn it? Yeah, well, yeah. Look, I, I think emotional intelligence is one of those things where from a communication standpoint, this is how I would teach my students to start building more emotional intelligence as a communicator. So when you're, when you're out communicating daily, there are some people you're going to meet that you immediately feel drawn to and feel attracted to and, and feel rapport with very quickly. Often when we have those experiences, when we walk away from those experiences, we just go, oh, wow, that was such a nice gal. She was so nice. She was so, she was so fun. And that's it. We, we, we stop thinking about that experience. When we're trying to develop more of that self-awareness and emotional intelligence, we, we have to walk away from these, those experiences and immediately think and go, why did that person engage me in that way? How, how come that person connected with me so quickly? What was it about them? Was it the way they spoke? Was it their language? Was it their body language? Was it their facial expressions? Was it, their, was it the melody in their voice? Was it them storytelling? What was it? And, and as you actually start to sit down and reflect and review that experience, you're starting to build more awareness, right? You're starting to go, oh, right, it was this, it was that. And then you're starting to build that EQ. And then also the opposite is true. When you meet someone that really rubs you the wrong way, when you meet someone that you go, oh, far out. I mean, I, I, I don't, I just want to seize this communication immediately and walk away. Yeah. Instead of just going, what a wanker, think to yourself, what was it about that person? Was it the way they spoke? Was it their body language? Was it the way they looked with their face? Was it because they gave you no eye contact? Was it because of the melody they used? They spoke to you in a way that made them seem superior? So I, I would say as a first point, if you're trying to build that self-awareness and also your emotional intelligence is when you walk away from these experiences on a daily basis and they tend to occur to all of us, take a step back and reflect yep. on that experience. Why? And Why did that happen? It's a tough question. If you're looking at yeah. top three things in high EQ people, like mm. qualities versus, and then maybe the bottom three qualities in lower EQ people, what would they be? First one would be understanding yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds a bit strange, but the more you understand yourself, the more you understand other people, right? When you don't really have a deep understanding of you as a person, then you can't understand other people. And, and I guess the, the wisdom there is that we're all human. We are much more similar than we are different. So when you seeking more understanding in yourself, you're going to inevitably understand other people better. I'll give you an example. It's, I was standing in line with Hei Wen and Xander. We we're just on a holiday and, and someone was just, someone just pushed in and was super rude, right? And they just pushed in, they were super rude. And then the people behind me got really upset, really angry. And to me, I, I, I just didn't feel angry at all. I, I don't yeah. know why. I just didn't feel, hey, when was upset? I just didn't feel angry at all. And I just said to the lady, I just said, oh, hey, I don't think you realize, but the line's just around the corner. And then yeah. she apologized profusely. She said, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I, di I didn't even realize. And I was like, yeah, it's okay. It's all good. And then she just walked yeah. to the back of the line. But it's just, it's just a simple moment where I, I was observant and I realized that I don't think she noticed that we were in the line because there was such a big gap between myself yeah. and the other person. I just, I, yeah, I was just more situationally aware. Whereas everyone yeah. else immediately assumed, oh, this person's a terrible person. They all started bickering <laughs> behind me. So, so I, think, I think the first thing is in understanding yourself, you understand others. And in that situation for me, it was more, I reckon that I've, like, I've done that before where I've just yeah. 
done something without thinking and 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 that's what I assume the person did as well. That's the first thing. I love thing. this. I just love this as a concept. I think the the how you behave in a line test could be yeah. nearly the ultimate measure of EQ. Like <laughs> I, just to, even from traveling really? just recently, like seeing how yeah, people yeah. were operating in the airport yeah. lines when like yeah. the the stress is pretty high, you might be missing mm. flights. Like there's such a big variety. Like just thinking about high EQ. The high EQ people were way calmer they yeah. smiled more they mm. were more helpful they were probably more courteous more like positive like their language like they would have little jokes like haha like what else at least we're we're all going to get on the flight at the same time you know like like yeah, all yeah. these yeah. kind of things and then like you could see the other version of it like agitated fidgeting yeah. snarl on the face yelling at people if somebody accidentally pushed in or like, you know, sometimes how like somebody will be doing something and there's a line of 400 people, but they don't walk up like four steps, even though the line's not really going to move. And then you see the people behind like, oh, like surely this person could just move forward, <laughs> even though that's no real difference on the impact. I think the line, like put mm. people in a long line, see how they operate and you'll be able to quickly figure out. <laughs> Who's high and low IQ, EQ. That's right. That's right. It, it might be a cool test to be able to go, yeah, yeah. who's displaying high levels of EQ in a line? Yeah. But or I, if you want to I, test your EQ, just yeah, get, get into a long stand line. In a <laughs> <laughs> See how you roll. Well, well look again. So, so back to the first thing. Yeah. I think it's just yeah. understanding yourself. You know, the, yeah. the more you become aware of your own emotions and the more you understand yourself, the, the higher levels of EQ you will have naturally because if that's you understand great. yourself, you understand other people. So I think that's yeah, the yeah. first thing. I'd say the second thing with EQ is being able to control your own emotions. You know, it's, it's the ability to control the emotion and not falling victim to impulse. I like because, that. I mean, emotional intelligence, in the very word, it's you're intelligent emotionally. You, you, you understand that, all right, I'm feeling angry right now. I'm not going to immediately call this person and, and abuse them. You know, it's, it's just about you being in more control. So I think it's, it's about, the second thing would be definitely being able to control your emotions more. So when you see someone who's able to control their emotions in a line where it's a very stressful environment, yeah. again, that's an indicator of someone who's got more EQ, right? Yeah. And number three, I'm trying to think because I think, I think there are a lot of things, but I reckon number three would be the ability to, adjust their behavior to be able to accommodate those around them mm. in, in a way being a bit of a chameleon right that that is also an indicator for someone that has really high eq because you, you notice them change their approach depending on the context of what's currently happening Whereas you, you also encounter people who regardless of any context regardless of any situation they show up in the exact same way, right? And, and I think that's someone who doesn't have very good high levels of situational awareness, emotional intelligence, where someone who's very emotionally intelligent can move into a situation, move into a room, immediately be able to read the room and then act accordingly. Mm. And I think that's super cool. That, you know, th that, and that's what I would say. I mean, I think there are more things that I, I, I kind of contribute to someone being emotionally intelligent, but that would be the top three. I love that. I think nearly out of everything we've done in a podcast, if that yeah. little snippet of those three things to improve your EQ life, <laughs> and just the, the return on investment you get from doing those three things. Yeah. And like, we've never really spoken about this topic, but if you think about it, like, like as, as you were speaking there, I'm like, yeah, you, you're like a master of communication, but I think your real skill set, you'd have, a, if, I don't know how you measure EQ, and I'm sure there's a way to do it, but my guess is your mm. testing on EQ would be off the charts. Like I've seen you in different group environments where I'm like, surely in this environment, <laughs> he's not going to be able to build rapport and be able to connect with everyone like straight away. And then within two minutes, you've got 55 best friends and <laughs> people are like... <laughs> How do we get more of that? You know, like, like I remember the, the, the best example is like Chantel's brother, like watching you like with Corey, who, who I would say is about a 4%, like he's going to like about 4% of people on this earth. And then wow. like, like you're just sitting there like, you're like, all right, I'm going to have to do magic tricks to win this guy over. But, like, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> but oh, oh, There's a I shout mean, out for him. He'll love that. But yeah, I think... 
I love I think, Corey. Yeah, like, Corey's an awesome human, right? <laughs> well, 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 I think let's use the Corey example. Let's let's let's, let's sit on this for a moment. Oh, yeah. well, we because go. well, here's the thing. I, I even before I met Corey, you've told me so much about Corey and and who he is as a person. And so before I even met Corey, I really wanted to connect with Corey because he sounded like such a great person. I really wanted to be connected to this person, become friends with them. And that's why I put a lot of effort in to, to that, that moment, right? And one of the most important things I think with emotional intelligence is you have to be, become really good at listening to people and not just their words, but you have to become really good at listening to their body language. What do they like? What don't they like? You know, what kind of magic would Corey like? What kind of magic would Corey not like, right? He, he doesn't like the cheesy <laughs> types of magic. What was interesting was, was Corey really enjoyed the more cerebrally you know, the, the more yeah. cerebral types of magic. He really liked that. I yeah. could tell, right? So it's an, an, again, and, and I was able to tell that because I had to listen to his body language because he didn't, <laughs> he didn't express verbally much yeah. about how amazing what was going on. It was all in his facial expressions. <laughs> if you looked at his facial expressions, it was hilarious. But if I wasn't paying attention to his facial expressions, I wouldn't be able to tell what kind of magic he liked if I based it yeah. purely on the verbal communication. Yeah. So, so I think being able to, read people, read their body language, read the emotion in the situation. And I think being able to read the mood and emotion is so important as well. And, and that's such an intangible thing. It's not like someone says, I'm feeling excited right now. You know, there, there's no buttons on people. <laughs> How handy would that be? If there was like a little yeah, signal. I know, I know. It's like, do not talk to me right now. <laughs> it's yeah, like, exactly. oh, okay, yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's when, you, when you start to dissect emotional intelligence and talk about yeah. this, this mood, I mean, how, how weird is it? But there's always a mood in conversations. There's always a mood that, that exists when you're connecting with someone. You know, and, and the better you get at reading those moods and then adapting to it, the better you're able to create the experiences like we had. You know, we, we had a great time you know, that, that, that evening with Corey, his partner, and, and the family. It was fantastic. Yeah. 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 No, but but that, that just goes to show yeah. that when you're emotionally intelligent, you can step into situations where you need to build rapport quickly and effectively. You can do it. It's possible. It, and, and it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to connect with every single bloody person you meet on this earth, but it just means that the chances of you being able to do it when it matters most, it's really high. It's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> and that concept just around attention and awareness of situation. I think the real word there is developing the skill of situational awareness. Yeah, yeah. You know, like right. even when I think about it, when I've been in meetings and when you're in negotiations, the people that do the best and create the most value in those situations generally have mm. the greatest level of situational awareness. You know, they can mm. see past what's happening on the surface level, but they can think four, five, six different steps ahead. It's like, yeah. okay, well, this person wants to hear this. This person's incentivized by this. This person needs this. This person mm. talks a lot, so we need to just listen and be quiet while they get that out of their system. This person's <laughs> going to say no words, but they're going to ask the most important question and they make all the decisions. So the whole mm. thing has to be for that. And it's like, if you can factor in all these different things, and I think that is the practice level of the skill, mm. uh, which is ultimately yeah, awareness, right? Self-awareness awareness of others around you knowing how to read that predict certain things and mm. i think that just gets developed over time but you've really given everyone the foundations there which is around it's really around being attentive right i love that what you said before like know when people are doing it really well try to deconstruct what is it that yeah. they're actually doing and that's right if they're not doing it well what what is it there that's kind of repelling and, people and that's charisma right well that's right and and and, yeah. and you can also just even from a communication standpoint, like, like I said to you, that, that's where I tell my students to apply this lesson is mm. for a week, just for a week. And, and you'll be shocked at what you learn yourself <laughs> in seven days, yeah. mm. right? You, you can go to a coach like me, you can come to a teacher like me to learn communication skills, or you can also, while building your own emotional intelligence and, and becoming more emotionally intelligent, you can start to work on your own communication skills and self-coach yourself as well. Because- yeah. If, if everyone has to find, you know, it, it opens up an, a more interesting topic as well, that who do you want to be, mm. right? The whole idea of who do you want to become? Who do you want to be? I mean, that, that's, that's a very difficult question to answer. And I think 
the only way to know who, the only way to really be able to form who you want to be is to get some kind of direction to kind of get a, I mean, this is for me personally, and I'd love to, to ask you the same question after, but for me, how do I know who I want to be? Well, to me, inspiration helps immensely. I, I love being able to go, well, these are the five people I'm inspired by. I don't want to be each or any one of them in particular, but I want to be some kind of combination of them. And then there's a part me in there as well, but it's a combination of all of that. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's why I think one of the best things we do in the life design process is we talk about who are you inspired by and why are you inspired by them? Yeah. Yeah. You what know, because then you get you to go, to emulate. Oh, that's right. And you can go, oh, yeah. these are the key things I like from this person. These are the key things I like from that person. And it's not that I'm, I'm becoming, I'm losing who I am. No, yeah. no. Th these are the things that I find really inspiring. And that comes from me. I find that inspiring because yeah. there are things I find inspiring. For example, what I find really inspiring about Kevin Hart is that he has a crew. Yeah. He's got a crew of people that he does stuff with. Now, if you ask 20 people what they like about Kevin Hart, that never comes up. It rarely yeah. comes up about his crew. That, that, that's what they, they like him because he's funny. They like him because he's charismatic. It's usually just to do with him. But again, we like different things about different people for different reasons. And the things that we like in others tends to be a little bit of a, it's something in us that we, we, we want. Yeah. So just because you're modeling others doesn't mean that you're losing who you are. No, it's just, it gives you clues as to who you want to become. Yeah, it's true. And I think that links to, we can probably tick off another question that came through was mm. how do you deal with comparing yourself to others? Oh, right? We did and, get that one. Yeah. And the way that I look, like just when I saw that question come up, because I think that's, that's, this could be nearly one of the biggest, call it nearly issues that our generation and the generation, you know, the next generation are going to face is just because of the social media world is this constant yeah. feeling of call it, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy because of this comparison to others there. And where, where yeah. does that finish or stop? But the way that when, mm. I, when I saw that question pop up, like how I would react to it is it's like, if you think about comparing yourself to others, don't ever mm. look at it from the downside. Like that's, that's probably where I would start with. It's like, if you're comparing yourself to somebody else, don't start with the deficiency model, which is automatically where we start looking at all the things that we don't have that that other person has and we're now a lesser person because we don't have it because it's so easy to find. You can find that uh, scrolling for eight seconds, like I'll be able to find 500 things, you know, where I'm like, oh yeah, I don't have that, that, I'm not good at that, not, not tall enough, you know, whatever it is. Like you've got so many different things that you could focus on where yeah. the comparison's negative, where I think it's nearly switching that and what you just spoke about there, where it's like, look at it from a qualities perspective right? Like mm. not what that outcome is or the shiny object or whatever it is, the things that are within your control where you're like, Hey, I really, if I'm going to compare myself to somebody else, it's like that person's doing something or they have a skill or they have something in the controllables where it's like, if I do these three to five things, I'll be able to emulate that because mm. that's definitely in your control. And it probably reduces that level of anxiety or call it the deficiency model where it's like, I'm not good enough or I'll never be that to, mm. hey, wait a second, like Kevin Hart, like I love what you picked from Kevin Hart, right? Like you call that the comparative model rather than being like, okay, I want to be a world-class comedian that does stand-up comedy shows and has a private jet. You went with, I like that he creates with a crew, right? Mm. Something pretty manageable where you can look at somebody like Kevin Hart, which is like a one in a billion type of performer, mm. essentially. You know, there's maybe there's maybe five, six people in his category. So if you're going to, I want to be the next Kevin Hart, that's that's a great goal, but it's pretty difficult. Whereas if you're like, hey, I want to develop an entourage or a crew where I can get to create cool shit, like what Kevin Hart's doing, mm. you can probably figure that out with three to five moves and without feeling the the deficiency model potentially. Um of what that looks like, but that's a really cool yeah, perspective that, that on comparison. Question. No, it's yeah. it's a really it's a really cool perspective of comparison because you can look at someone and you can compare and it crushes you, or you can be inspired by it and it lifts you. Yeah. Right. And and I think it's it's so easy to compare 
Simp- well, simply because that's the default. That's the easy one to do. It's it's easy to do that. It's easy. It's it's easy to compare. It's hard to be inspired by it, right? I, I, and it depends on where you are in life too. I feel like if you if you if you are in a place where you feel super hopeless, then it's very difficult to be inspired, right? It's very easy to go straight to the comparison and go, ah, oh, I'm never going to be this. I'm never going to be as good as this person. And it, and, it, and it kind of brings me to a point of, well, that's why I think it's important to have useful beliefs. And I know this is going to sound a little bit weird, but <clears throat> I was doing a Q&A while I was in Perth and it was with a group of entrepreneurs. And, you know, when I'm on stage, I, I give off the vibe a little of, you know, that, that I really believe anything is possible. Yeah. Right? And, and I think that that's a really trite thing to say. I think it's a really, it rubs a lot of people the wrong way. You know? <laughs> it's a big statement. And it's a big statement. It's a big statement, right? Because, because I, I remember on a video where we put out on social media on TikTok. Yeah. And that video got a little bit of fire. It started to reach a pretty big audience. And of course you'll get the, you know, get the trolls come on yeah. board. And then yeah. two comments really stoke, uh, stood out for me because I kind of said, look, I kind of think that the idea that anything is possible or the belief that anything is possible, it's a useful belief. And one comment was, okay, wise guy, cure, cure boldness. <laughs> and then another one was, then, then cure Sorry, cancer. Sorry, man, I, I shouldn't have written that to you. I was yeah, out yeah, of yeah, line. Yeah, I yeah. apologize. <laughs> <laughs> right, so it was cure boldness and then cure cancer <laughs> Cure yeah. leukemia, or all of this kind of stuff, right? And, I, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and what's interesting is then it made me it made me reflect. Yeah. Because is it, you know, is it something that I should say? Mm. And, and it was really interesting because as I was reflecting on it and, and thinking about it, and I just kind of thought to myself, well, well, the person that's one day going to cure boldness because I believe that it will be cured, so there's still hope, Ali. Yeah. And the person who's going to cure cancer, the person who's going to cure the diseases that we currently have that person needs to believe that it's possible because how else would they do it? Where else would that motivation come from? Because if you believe that it's not possible, then shit, you're not even going to try. And and it just made me think about the whole concept of useful beliefs. I'm, I'm not saying that anything in actuality is possible. I'm just saying that it's a useful belief. Because the alternative is like nothing is possible. Well, that's right. right. So, so if you're going in with that belief system of yeah. nothing with, like, I think you've got a better chance of forward movement with anything is possible than that's right. if you if your general like sort of philosophy is nothing is possible. I don't know. It's well, but you've 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 got you've got to you've got to sit on this thought for a bit little longer because instead of because what what I feel now in my life is that instead of just having these knee jerk reactions to people's thoughts. I like to sit on these thoughts for a little bit and do a little bit of deep thinking as opposed to just going, nah, you're wrong, fake. You know, it's kind of all- Delete. <laughs> yeah, delete, blocked. You know, I'm the best. I'm the king of the world. <laughs> I'm amazing. It's, I, I like it when there are these challenging thoughts because it, it forces you to think about why you think the way you think a little more. And then it, it forces you to, to stress test it a little bit, right? And it's- it could also be damaging to believe that anything is possible because if you believe anything is possible, you will reach for things that you maybe never be able to achieve. And then as a result, never feel a sense of success. So you've got to be aware enough to know whether these beliefs help you or harm you. Mm. And, and for me, again, not speaking for other people, is that when I do believe that anything is possible, it allows me to live a life that is more exciting. Yep. You know, whether I achieve some of the things I really want to achieve or not, it, it's, it's okay. It's just, it's a useful belief for me because it helps me live a more exciting life. It helps me live a life that is more optimistic. Yep. And I like who I am better when I believe in this. And, you know, I think, yeah. it, I think having these types of statements as well, they're very relative to the individual, right? Like yeah, if right. I, like I know you very well. And like when you say, anything is possible, like say is like, you know, a, a line or as a mantra or whatever it is, you, mm. you do kind of live it, right? Like you're somebody who is like, like I love just like to put it in perspective, right? Like 
English is your second language and you're one of the best people in the world at communicating in that language. And you, you do that. So like it's a, you, hold like, on. You you don't you don't know me as well as you think you do because English was my third language. <laughs> third language. So English is your third language. And you, that's like how you like perform, create, that's your business in what you do, right? Now that's that means that like the term anything is possible. Like you've got a little bit of evidence there that suggests that things that are highly improbable, you've been able to turn them into being possible, right? So it makes sense. Whereas if I look at mine, like I probably don't go with anything as possible. Like my one when for the most part of my life, it was more around like the underdog. I liked exceeding your expectations. Similar type of one, but you you got you're aiming higher, whereas I aim lower and I want to like exceed that. You know, mm. so similar types of things. But mm. I think these mm. these types of statements that we we put out there, like again, it goes back to self awareness and knowing all those bits and pieces. It's very mm. different if like you've done nothing in your life that will low odds call it. And then your mantra is anything is possible. It might not make too much sense yet. You know, like yeah. you, you've, you've actually taken actions and you've done the work. You've taken chances. You've taken risks. You've made decisions. You've, you know, engaged with people around you. So there's like, like if you tell me anything's possible, like I'm not going to argue against you on that because i'm like all right well yeah, there's enough evidence there to show that hey if you say it there's probably a good chance you might be able to turn that into a reality whereas for others that might not relate so i think the cool thing here though is is like finding these statements and nearly developing them over time and refining yeah, them right. in alignment with who you are and you, you touched on it before like having having beliefs that work or values that work for you as an individual um, and then forming those into some type of statement that then helps you either to make decisions, choices, allocate your time, your energy, your resources. Because I'm guessing for you as well, like if you have a couple of opportunities and options on the table, mm. you're probably going to go for the one that's more in, in the anything is possible bucket mm. rather than the, hey, this is a really safe play, Vin. We should just do this. It's got <laughs> like a 90% chance of success. That's probably not as much anything as possible. That's like, yeah, probably... Pull the, that one feels very positive. I don't know. Well, no, you're right though. It, it's it's choose the useful beliefs that will help you. Yeah. Right. It's it's when when you look at a lot of the beliefs that I have. I mean, another one that I really love is that reality is negotiable. You know, when, when you when you look at some of my favorite quotes and some of the things that I I really love, it, it's all to do with that. You know, th thing things are bendable. Yeah. You know, so it's it's yeah, it's just. I don't know. Pick useful beliefs that help you, and then well, you even, get to decide what they are. Like if you if you think about just touching back on something you mentioned earlier, like, and I put this with a lot of bunny years around the word, call it success, right? And what we all traditionally view as as success in this world, I think it's generally like, and like let, let's use the word exceptional outcomes to substitute that for the world, word success, right? Like people that achieve exceptional outcomes, whether it's in sports, business, whatever it's going to be, um, you know, their vocation, their art form. I think it's just how far they were willing to go between the gap of like anything is possible, like the most outrageous dreams and then coloring that in with reality, right? Like that's, that's yeah. probably the equation. It's yeah. like how ridiculous was that long shot? How low were the odds? How competitive was that environment? How hard was it to be able to execute that outcome? And then unfortunately, the the few people that get all the different circumstances that work in their favor, they take the actions, they get luck, they're, they're in the right place at the right time, they're born in the right country, or whatever it is. You know, there's all these millions of different things that take place, luck, chance, opportunity, effort, whatever it is. Those that then actually end up pulling it off end up getting celebrated in quotation marks as success. Sometimes through <laughs> through just chance, um, but usually with a fair bit of effort. Um, well, it's but well, the the reason why I bring up the importance of useful beliefs is because your beliefs dictate your actions in your life, right? If you believe something to be possible, then you know if you, if you believed it wasn't possible for you to develop any muscle, you wouldn't go to the gym. Why would you go? If you believe it's not possible for you, why would you go? You just wouldn't go. If you believed it was impossible for you to be able to do archery, yeah. then you, you'd never buy the bow because yeah. why? Why would I do that? It's impossible. If you believe that you, you, 
you could never start a podcast. You, you'd never record your first episode because why would you do that for? It's not possible for you, right? And, and I, I say this because I've been reflecting a lot and, and I, 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 you know, now, now that I've been able to develop an okay social media following. I mean, if you compare me to some of the people online, far out, I've, I've got nothing, right? But six months ago, I had about 8,000 followers, right? And, and now when I did a meeting with my team last, last month, collectively on all the platforms, we've got over, over a million people following us on social media. And it's a massive increase. I've been creating content for the last nine plus years. And if I didn't believe that one day I would be able to have the influence I have now and be able to have the impact that I have now, I would have stopped creating content at year 0.5. I would have stopped halfway in. So it's just, again, the, the reason why I bring this up while we're talking about comparison is that <clears throat> when I have the belief that anything is possible, you know, again, with reality, cuddle it in. I love the way you eloquently put that because it's like, I, I, you know, I'm not going to go on the roof and jump because I believe I can fly. <laughs> you know, it's like, like I, I understand the limitations of this, but I also understand the upside of it. Yeah. In that having that belief helps me not compare myself to other people because when I see what other people have done in their lives, and, and again, I, I really don't want this to come from an egotistical place. But it's when I see other people do the things they do, I just think to myself, well, if I wanted the same things as them, if I had the exact same values as them, I could do it. But that's not what I want. I don't want their life. I don't want the things they have. I don't want the family they have. I don't want that. I just want one thing. I want the crew. I, I love yeah. what Kevin Hart does, I, the crew. So if Kevin Hart could become successful with the crew, I can too. I can, I can create a crew of my own and achieve impact the way I want to achieve impact, right? Yeah. And then it just stops me from comparing because when I start to compare in a negative way, it's often because I don't believe I could do anything. I don't believe I could do that. Yeah. And, and the moment that creeps in, then I compare in a negative way. Mm. For sure. Whereas I find others to be more inspiring because I believe that if I find something I really want to do, then I'm going to be able to do it. Mm. You know, it, it's just kind of that, but I guess for some, it's very hard to develop those useful beliefs. Yeah. Because when I think and back also, to how I've developed the useful beliefs, I've developed it because I've seen my mum and my dad do it their entire lives. <laughs> I've seen my family have nothing and build everything. I've seen them build businesses from nothing to something that took care of my family, my cousins' families, extended family members, you know, members of the community. I, I've, I've seen them do the impossible so many times. And it's kind of being ingrained in me from when I was young. They did the impossible before I was even born. They escaped the war on a boat that they built. I mean, that's insane. You know, it's just all these little things have helped me develop some useful beliefs. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know, how would someone develop it if they didn't have parents like that? They didn't have the upbringing you know, how, how do you, yeah, how do you develop that? Yeah, I think it's, mm. we talk about it, we, we do a little bit in life design, right? Where it's nearly an analysis of what are some of the beliefs and values that you've got at the moment, depending on where you are in life, that, you know, which are the ones that are really nourishing you and serving you well, and then which ones aren't that you might need to change. And then where do you then go and then find those new ones that you then, bring into your life right like we and that's where if you look at the plus side of all the content that gets created nowadays and you look at social media the plus mm. side there is if you follow the right people that you need at the right time yeah, that's right that's how you can find some of these new values and beliefs and then mm. the the key is then trying to practice them right like one of the things that we do when we talk about like values in every aspect of life can just become throwaway lines. You know, like when you see companies are like, we value integrity, we value yeah. teamwork. It's like, yeah, these are great, these are great words. And people will sometimes sit there when they do value exercises and belief exercises and they'll be like, yeah, I value generosity. It's like, okay, well, what have you done in the last 12 months that was truly generous? Yeah. Right? Like if that is one of your values, or if you, I value family, it's like, okay, list 15 things that lit you up with your family, like mm. that were positive, right? Like, so it's yeah. finding out those top five to 10 values that you actually do truly value or believe in, mm. and then seeing how they match up with reality. 
in your life. And then also finding a few new ones that you then need to integrate. And how do you plug those in? And then what's an action plan to, to actually embed those? Because just writing it down that it's a value of yours probably won't be enough. It's then around, okay, well, how do I then act this out? How am I executing what's, it? What's really interesting is that I've always known that your beliefs dictate your actions. I wonder if the reverse is also true. Your actions gradually become your beliefs. Your actions become your values, right? It's, do you think it's possible to continually act out, act in a certain way? Let's say, say, say for example, you are not currently generous, but you want to become more generous because it's a value you want to have. If you start being generous more often, do you think it gradually becomes a value? Yeah, for sure. So you, you, you believe it can work both ways? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But I think you've got to have intention though, right? Like the big thing there is around awareness and intention because sometimes yeah. you can be taking action. And this happens, I think, to a lot of people where so much of the action is very reactionary. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not proactive action. It's like, okay, I just do these things because it's part of my world, you know, that I've been given. Right. And so it, it still probably comes a value and a belief, but you might not even know it. You might not know how to amplify it. It might be hurting you. Um, mm -hmm. So without doing that sort of analysis and reflection, I think it's pretty difficult to to know where you, where you need to take it, how it's actually yeah, benefiting so you to, or not. So to tie up this this kind of thought process, so that 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 in a way means that if if you want to develop a useful belief or a useful value, write that belief and that value down. For example, if the value or the belief you want to develop is that reality is negotiable, instead of just writing that statement or writing the value, come up with five ways in which you can turn that value into a verb, right? Yeah. So five ways in which, say your value is generosity, for example. Let's use a simpler example. It's generosity. <laughs> what are five ways in which you can become more generous in the next four weeks? You know, it might be I take one of my family members out to lunch. It, yeah. it might be to find a way to contribute some of my time to the local community center, right? And, and I think by, by acting out some of these beliefs and values, you're going to start to develop and strengthen some of those beliefs that you want to have, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's really cool. I've never thought about it in the reverse. You know, I always knew in a way, because I, I guess I have some strong beliefs. I always knew that these beliefs of mine really served me because they dictate the way I act. But I never thought about it in reverse. I never thought, huh, you could actually kind of go in the reverse and then help you develop some really useful beliefs that help you through life more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think action is the way that you try them on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because if you try being generous for, for a month and you go, you know what? I actually hated that experience. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Then you're going to no. go, well, there you go. Yeah. You shouldn't be generous. Yeah. It's not your My value. value is actually security. I want more money and time in my no, own no, but, time and hey, money hey, bank I, account. I, and I, and, but I wouldn't bash on that because nah, if, so, if someone is feeling that, it means that yeah. they haven't been able to look after themselves yet. Yeah. And if you're not able to, if you're not able to look after yourself, then you're not ready to look after other people. Right? You kind of have to look after yourself first because I, I know some people who wanted to be more generous and, uh, and, and then started being more generous and then started to be resentful of others. And it was because they haven't been able to look after themselves yet. And until you can look after yourself, you can't look after other people. You kind of have to look after yourself first. Yep. Mm. And I mean, okay. right in the beginning, the reason why this whole kind of conversation started was because of comparing. Mm. And just to link it back just for a moment, I, I think that when you, when you have strong beliefs and you have strong values and you have clarity, which is another point we can talk about, when you have clarity on what it is that you want, you're less obsessed about what other people are doing. You're less obsessed about comparing yourself to other people. I, I find that when I have clarity on what I want, I don't spend a lot of my time comparing. Yep. Well, because I'm clear on what I want, so I'm kind of focused on what I want to do in my life. I'm not kind of looking at everybody else and what they're doing. It's when we don't have clarity. What do we do when we don't have clarity? <clears throat> We're less motivated. We procrastinate more. And in procrastination, that's where comparison lives. 
because that's when you're mindlessly just scrolling other people's lives and, and forgetting that this is just them living their best life. This is just them take, take, taking the best parts of their life and amplifying it on social media. So I, I reckon the root of a lot of problems because every time I go on and do an Instagram live, when I ask people to do the Q and A and ask me questions, overwhelming number of questions, how do you deal with procrastination? How do you deal with a lack of motivation? How do you deal with a lack of inspiration? I really believe that the root of most of our problems in life come from a lack of clarity. For sure. We compare with others because we have too much time because we don't have clarity and we're not working on our own lives. We're looking at other people's lives. It just, it all seems to stem back to clarity. And, and I think alignment too, right? If you have clarity and you have that combination of both clarity and alignment, mm. it pretty much kills off the desire to need motivation and to have to deal with procrastination. I think it also like, you know, and this is <laughs> like not an expert in this field by any means, but I think it also helps with mitigating against anxiety and fear as an mm. overwhelming emotion, right? Because we go back to that gap, bridging the gap between what we want and then the reality that we're living. That's where I think all those things thrive. If you think about it, like if it's, if it's a little farm ecosystem, like things like fear, anxiety, you know, lack of motivation, lack of contentment, addiction, probably all these things, they love that gap in between what we wish we had versus how we're living. And they're like, oh, mm. give us more of that. You know, like that's where I'm going to fester and just, you know, get you to a point where like, yeah. And I think that's the battle that most people are fighting today is how do you, because it's nearly step one in a lot of ways. Like if you've got relative levels of comfort and security and shelter and food, it seems like that's the next level. It's like, okay, well, how do we now mitigate against those feelings of am I living my purpose? My am I fully exceeding my potential? Whatever that might be. Um, and I think even in this episode, I think there's some really cool tips and tricks around that, like finding good value systems, belief systems, looking at emulation rather than compar comparison, self awareness, um, taking action that's aligned with who you are and who you actually want to become all those little moves probably end up chipping away at those feelings. Like, I don't know about you, like, do you, do you feel much anxiety or fear? Not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really trying to, to think if I, if I do not really, yeah. not a lot of fear, not a lot of anxiety. During the pandemic, yeah, at the start of the pandemic, hell yeah, a lot, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, but not anymore. Yeah. I think it subsided and yeah. a lot of it has gone away because again, I have more clarity, which leads to more certainty. You know, there's always an element of uncertainty in my life. I, mean, I guess as entrepreneurs, there's never certainty. No one pays our paycheck. We, we, we generate our own revenue. We make our own money. But yeah, not really. You know, it's, I'm sure I, there are times where I do feel anxious. I'm sure there are times when I do feel fear, but it's not something that is, it's not crippling. Yep. Whereas I know for a lot of people it is. Mm. Why do you ask that? No, no, I think it's just because I wonder if that is based on the fact that you are living it pretty aligned and you know, mm. you're living life with a pretty good well, degree of clarity. Well, where, where do you think I, a lot I of I think that the, is the outcome. I, I feel that I feel the most anxiety. I mean, I'm thinking back to the last time I felt really anxious it was at the start of the pandemic and I felt a lot of fear. And the reason why I felt a lot of that anxiety and fear is because I didn't have clarity on what's, what's happening. I, I, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know how I was going to get through it. I didn't have any strategies, <clears throat> didn't have any plans, nothing. And then I just, it was just extremely crippling because I had no idea what was about to happen. And then as we sat down, I remember the many conversations we had at like, you know, I was still living in LA at the time. You were in Melbourne. 
I was up at like 9 p.m. my time. You were early morning. And the more we started to talk and map out a plan of attack, the more I started to gain clarity on how I was going to navigate the situation, had a plan of action, the anxiety and the fear subsided. Yep. And then that's, that's why, again, I, I, more and more, even when I look through my journal and I look to the times where I felt I didn't feel good, it's again, it's just a lack of clarity. It just feels as if it, that, that's, that's the root of all evil. You know, it, it's, mm. it's, and, and, and the, the thing is, I feel like we live, in a today, we live in a world today where we're consuming so much and we don't spend enough time thinking, mm. reflecting, reviewing, recalibrating, right? We don't, we, we spend a lot of the time that we have finding pacifiers, <laughs> Whether it's the phone, whether it's Netflix, whether it's Dopamine hits. YouTube. Yeah, we just, we, we, we pacify all the time. We're continually just pacifying ourselves to, to, to forget about how complex life is, how hard life can be, how confusing life can be. And pacifying is so, it's so readily available now. I mean, you, I, I can immediately pacify right now if I wanted to, Ali. <laughs> it's just a, a face scan away from me pacifying. <laughs> And because it's so readily available, we go straight to the dopamine hits. And I mean, again, like they've done study that like, this is kind of like having keys to the alcohol cabinet, having keys to drugs. So we're just medicating ourselves and not doing the hard work. Because think about this, bro. At the end of last year, you, me, and a group of our friends went away for four to five days, locked ourselves in a house, didn't touch our phones, and we went through the recalibrate process. We sat through five days of sitting there talking nonstop for 12 hours, calling each other out on our bullshit, really deeply reflecting on what, 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 what do I want? Starting feeling frustrated, annoyed, and going, oh, this is too hard to answer, and sitting with it. Hmm. And then at the end of those five days, we all walked away clearer. We didn't have crystal clear enlightenment clarity, but we were way clearer than when we, you know, when, yeah. when we kind of sat down at the beginning of the five days. And I think the resistance to just sitting with your own thoughts, the resistance to actually going through a process to gain clarity stops a lot of people from living out their potential. Yeah. And it's funny because one of the questions we got is, if you and I were going to write a book, what would, what would we write a book about? And, and I think the book, I mean, it's not really, I think the, the book you and I want to write is the book on the process of recalibrating, recalibration, recalibrating your life and, and designing a life you want to live. And I think a big part of that book, brother, is about clarity. For sure. You know, it's, 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 it's who are you right now? Are you living based on a version that, you know, are you, are you living life based on a previous version of who you are, which I think a lot of us are doing. And even if you just think of the way that the world's moving right now, mm. like this is like the area that people like this is like, you know, when there's pioneering areas, say if the last 10 years was like tech, and call it social media and greater digital connection, you know, or whatever it is. I think this is nearly the space that people are focusing on the most. It's like, how do I, like, I've just, everyone's experienced the pandemic. Their perspective may, may have changed on work, life, relationships, what they're doing, who they are. And now we're seeing it on the other side where it's like, okay, well, people are now consciously thinking about how they want to live. And, mm there aren't too many playbooks and frameworks that teach you this, right? Like if you think about it, yeah. they do exist in bits and pieces, but even when I think, you know, like I think about the process that we go through, I think it's, it's probably one of the more like tested and complete processes for that. Just based mm -hmm. on the fact that not much of it really exists out there from what we've seen. And we, we look for those things, right? Because it's mm -hmm. something that we're always trying to optimize. So this could be the next generation and the next wave of, yeah, um, call it yeah, 
professional development, personal development that people are looking for. It's okay. Like uh, I've, I've succeeded in my career or I've achieved mm. these things or I want to do new things or whatever it is. How do I now do that? Um, and how do I make it really enjoyable and make sure that it really aligns with everything? Like, I just think it's now very, very difficult to go to an 18 or 20 year old and tell them, hey, you sign up for this grad program, you work 60 hours a week for the next 10 years, we'll give you this check. What do you think? I don't think there's big lines of people wanting to sign up for that. Like, mm. even when I think back to when we finished uni, there were lines of people wanting to sign up for that one. Yeah, yeah like, me included. Yeah, yeah, but I couldn't even get past like the first IQ test in most yeah. of those things. <laughs> I've got no chance in that environment. Whereas now, yeah. there'll be there'll be ads, you know, for join our grad program because the actual offering at its core probably just isn't enough to to get people yeah you know, over the line. So it's going to be very interesting, I think, over the next five to ten years to see what what the next generation do with how they work, how they live how they socialize, how they connect, what they're into. But yeah, that, that process of, yeah, purposefully doing it. And I think one of the things that you touched on there around the practical natures of just planning, scheduling, mm. action, you know, knowing which actions you need to take, prioritizing those, like these are the things that might bridge that gap between the reality that you want versus the reality that you're living. Well, you know, one of the, one of the most powerful things about scheduling and scheduling things in your diary, once you have clarity on what it is you want to do, because again, once you have clarity on what it is that you want, you can then map out a schedule that's going to allow you to move closer towards the goals that you've set. And I, I remember, I mean, I'm looking at my diary now, I've got it on my computer. And when sometimes I, I speak to some of my clients, I, I, I share my screen because I'm sharing with them kind of a workshop layout and then I accidentally click on my calendar or something and then they freak out. They look at they're like, oh, what the hell? Far out, was that your calendar, Vin? And <laughs> they freak out because I schedule a lot of stuff and, and just because I schedule it, it doesn't mean that I do all of them. Far out, I'm human. There are times I'm like, ah, eh, no, I'll move that to tomorrow. But one, what it does is it allows me never to miss anything. B is it allows me to set my intention, right? Is that, I'm being intentional about how I want to live my life. I'm not leaving a whole block of 20 hours free or 10 hours free. I'm going, well, you know what? Like, again, if I've got my diary right now, it shows that today I intend to have dinner with my family at five to six. And then between six and 6.45, I intend to take the dogs for a walk with my family. And it just, it gives me a nice, it gives me just a framework. Otherwise, when I have nothing scheduled, guess what we do? We pacify, right? We just end up pacifying. And, and again, I pacify, I, I use it, I love the dummy. But it's when you, when you have that clarity and you start to schedule things, you leave less room for just mindless pacifying. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I think, it's again, I, I think it's, it's one, of those, one of those things where I, I hope that people aren't, at times so confused and feeling so much pain and in such a terrible place that, that they just think to themselves, well, it's, I, I, I can't do the work. I can't get clarity. So I'm never even going to try. You'll never be ready. You know, I think we, we will always in life feel lost at times. We will always feel confused and it will always feel like it's too, too hard. But how, how do you, how do you lose weight? Just, one exercise session at a time, one step at a time. You know, how do you build a following on social media? Just one piece of content, one follower at a time. How do you build a podcast one episode at a time, one conversation at a time, one minute at a time, right? It's just everything takes one step at a time. And I would just highly encourage our listeners to spend a bit of time with yourself and, and just start reflecting on your life, reflecting the things that you've enjoyed in the last six months. I mean, we're bloody in August already. So look at your life and look at the last six months and what's gone well? Why has it gone well? What's gone bad? Why has it gone bad? Start to gain some clarity around who you are, what you like, what you don't like. 
you know, gain more clarity on what your values are, what values don't you want. It's, it's such an important process. It, and it's messy as hell. I mean, when we do life design, far out, we've got, I've got the paper right here, but it's, <laughs> it's like 20 pieces of paper everywhere and just questions all over the place. And, and it, it, it's messy, but that's how it starts. And I remember a message uh, exchange we had earlier this year when you were in Europe <clears throat> and I was back in Australia at the time. And I was, I was just saying, hey, quick update, brother. How's things going? And we both had things pretty well mapped out. And it was one of the first times you and I were pretty aligned with the life that we wanted to live. Mm. You know, it's kind of like, oh, I wouldn't change too much from it right now. And it was weird for us because <laughs> it was like, oh, there's no areas for improvement. That's weird. But it's kind of the first time where I feel we've been able to live a fairly aligned life. The first year where it felt super aligned, man. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, just interesting when you, when you set those intentions, yep. it just sets you a course. Mm. Yeah. Yep. It's true. And after you do it for a few years as well, you get better. At you don't it. have to do, you don't have to do massive rebuilds. They're just yeah. slight adjustments and optimization. First year is the hardest. Yeah. Yeah. The first time is probably the most difficult, but then after then it's just, yeah, just sharpening the saw a little bit. Which is cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, one of the questions that I really liked, I'm just going to quickly bring up, yep. is uh, <laughs> favorite movie Oh, that has been profound recently. <laughs> recently? Okay. Like the last movie that blew your mind was the specific question. I, 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 there was one that blew my mind, but I can't remember the name of it. Um, <laughs> it it's called, really blown your mind. It's called... Yeah, it's called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Oh, I, I was going to say this. Really? <laughs> this is the one. That, that movie happened. blew my freaking yeah, mind. Yeah. All right, well, this is good. We've got the same movie. Okay, I can't <laughs> believe that was a... Well, okay, I'm going to tell you straight up. That movie made me cry my ass off. Really? Oh, dude, I was crying my ass off. When, when Michelle Yeoh... Yeah. She plays the character of the mother. Okay, so for those of you who haven't seen this, uh, go watch it. It's a really out there movie, fascinating. Blew my, I, I thought I was about to watch a Kung Fu Asian movie and then it turned out to be this psychological thriller plus family. You know, I don't want to ruin it for people. So yeah. if you haven't watched it and you want to watch it, fast forward this. But the, but the essential plot of the movie is a daughter is coming out as being gay to her mum, and her mum basically goes through a psychological experience while she's trying to accept that her daughter is gay. All right. And I bawled my eyes out because of the journey that the mum had to go on to be able to accept that her daughter was gay. Mm. And that the mum went on that journey and got through it. You know, it, it showed how hard it was for the mum that she had to create this alternative. And the movie is so brilliantly done. But it's that it's it's like I have to go through hell because of the way I've been programmed in my life to better accept that my daughter is gay and I'm gonna go through it. Mm. And what made me cry was, man, she went through it. She was willing to go through all of that. It was just so beautiful because, again, it just portrayed the Asian culture, man. Like in the Asian culture, mm. it, it's it's still something. It's very difficult for a lot of people in the Asian community if they are gay to come out to their parents who are super traditional and grew up in a communist world. You know, it's a completely different world. So it really portrayed so well how difficult it would be for a traditional mm. Asian parent to be able to accept something like that and and, and Oh man. Yeah. Oh, that movie yeah. blew my mind. Agreed. No, nope. I think it was amazing. I think you, what you said there is going to be a lot more profound than anything that I was going to say. So we can oh. move on to the next question. Oh, okay. But what, well, the last thing I'll say <laughs> is that it's just, it, it, what made me again, really emotional was the love that a parent has for their child mm. and what yeah. parents like how deep that love is and how unconditional that love is that even though you've had, you know, the, the mum in this case, most likely had 50 years of programming in the old way she was willing to do. She was willing to fight her way through all of that programming that has been anchored into who she is as a person and a, a husband and her community that she undid all of that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a man. And that's how much you love your kids. It's oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, it's such a yeah unique, it's such a different movie too. Right? Yeah. Like I remember just leaving that movie and being like, that was a movie experience unlike nearly anything that I could remember for the last, maybe since like the matrix or something, you know, like it was just, they innovated something that I don't think had really been done before. Very, very well done. Well executed. All right. Well, rapid fire. This is not a paid endorsement. Uh, We should be (laughs) taking a clip on this one. (laughs) Oh gosh. All right. Next one is zombie apocalypse. What's your favorite weapon of choice? (laughs) This is from Anthony. I love it. So easy for me. For me, it's for me, it's a bow and arrow, a recurve bow, and I would also want a samurai sword because, again, you can't reload very quickly with an archery uh, with 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 a with a bow. So again, long distance kills, and then after that, samurai for close up. Yeah, mine would be invisibility cloak. Every time <laughs> they come, <you> just hide. <laughs> It fits with your coward nature. I like it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just go to sleep while yeah, they walk just, past. Yeah, yeah, fine. Wake right. up just later. Be living your life as per normal, really. Just kind of. <laughs> just every time they come, it's just put the cloak on and just get back to doing what we were doing before it. Anthony threw so many great questions. He's got two more. He says, <laughs> "What tasks or activities makes you guys feel like a kid again?" Oh, for you, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? What Lego. Lego. <laughs> yeah. Is it Lego the one that makes you feel like it? It is. I was trying to think of something that had that was a little bit more interesting. But yeah, Lego. Lego takes me back to being a kid every single time. For me, on this recent trip that I went, the thing that made me feel like a kid again was going to Wet and Wild in Queensland <laughs> and going down a massive slide with Xander, uh, sitting yeah. on a tube, like a little tube thing. We're sitting down. We're just, oh, just... That just made me feel like a kid again. It was, awesome. you know, we, we went down that slide like 10 times and yeah, just the smiles Xander and I had on our faces were just ear to ear, man. It was fully That's felt like cool. a kid again. And I'd say a second thing, a second thing that makes me feel like a kid again is spending time with Xander. Mm. You know, I think when you spend time with children, oh. you feel like a kid again. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Uh, favorite superhero villain and why? Well, villain. Yeah. Yep. It's a weird one. I, I think, I think the the Joker by Heath Ledger, really, that's dark. The, just the best villain character that's ever been portrayed and executed of all time. Genius. I would say for me is Loki, from Ooh. yeah Loki, and the reason I like Loki is because he kind Who's of symbolizes a oh, Loki. Loki, no, sorry, sorry, not Loki. Yeah, Loki, yeah, Loki, sorry. <laughs> like, English is my third language, Ali. Leave me alone. All right, sorry, bro. <laughs> sorry. Just, 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 wanted to, just like say people yeah. didn't start Googling Loki and they're like, no, nah, I don't know who that is. Well, yeah. well, the reason why I like Loki is that he's good and he's bad. Yeah. Right? Is that there's a good side to him yeah. and there's a bad side to him. And I, I think it's such a cool villain because it symbolizes us as human beings. You know, there's mm. good sides to us and there's bad sides to us. No one is Thor. No one is yeah. just always good and always, you know. So I think, yeah, kind of, it's kind of yeah. a cool, cool twist on a villain. I he's like a that. great character. Yeah, great character, and he's super funny too. He's hilarious. Yeah. All right, I'm looking at a couple more. Uh, there was one question from Alex that says, it, "All it says is about a girl," and a, yeah. and, a, and, a, and a, what was that even about? I don't even understand yeah. what that question is. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess you don't either. <laughs> <laughs> We approve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Moving on. Yeah. Um, I've got well, a I theme we... that I think came through in some of the questions. And yeah. this one's a little bit random. Yep. But the the broader topic is something to do with balancing the like arrogance and humility. Mm, okay. Right? Yeah. So what's your thoughts and feels just when you hear those those words and i'll tell you why i brought that up because okay. i think that like just if i think about it just whether it's in teams relationships mm-hmm. new relationships like we we're talking about earlier whether it's how we portray ourselves how we tell stories how we communicate like finding that balance between 
what can be perceived as arrogance versus humility. And it probably touches back to emotional intelligence a little bit as well. Yeah. But how do you approach that? Well, and again, I think it does come down to emotional intelligence because when you're emotionally more intelligent, you're more situationally aware of when to be able to display a certain behavior because the same behavior displayed in different situations can be perceived as arrogant or confident. Yeah. Right. It's really just the context in which you displayed that particular behavior. Mm. And the awareness of the situation is what's critical here. Mm. Right. For example, when I first moved to the U S I had to pitch myself to clients and we were on what was called win the deal calls. So you'd get on a call and you have to tell the client why you were great and why they should pick you. And I used to be terrible at them because in Australia, if I did that here in Australia, it'd be seen as I'm kind of, you know, a little bit, you know, you know, he's got his finger up his ass. He's, he's, you know, all about himself. So to me, when I moved to the U S I had, I was more aware that, Hey, over here, it's a little bit different over here. It's okay for us to, to, to share some of the wins more, to, to, to name drop some of the companies that we may have worked with. Whereas in Australia, it was kind of looked down upon, right? In Australia, it's better to have a, someone else sell you because for you to sell yourself, it's a little bit gross. Whereas in America, it was actually seen as a good thing. You didn't need to learn how to sell yourself. You, you've got to know what's good about you and don't be ashamed of sharing that. Share it. We want to know some of your wins because we want to know we're working with someone who is brilliant and someone that believes in themselves. So again, like having that situational awareness of going, oh, in Australia, I shouldn't really do this over here as much. I've got to be more sensitive to the way I do it. In the US, I can kind of sell myself a little bit more. And that cultural difference, just having that awareness is so important because if I acted the way I acted in the US here in Australia, it'd be seen as arrogant. Whereas in, Australia, in America, if I did it, I'm confident. So really, I think it's, it's having that That's, emotional intelligence. It's critical. Yeah. And even cultural awareness too about where you are, who you're around. Yeah, that's right. And, yep. and if you're not able to read the room, you know, for example, an Australian audience, when I get up and I talk about what I've done in the past and my credibility, I spend maybe a minute and 30 seconds talking about that. Hmm. Right. Because the audience, they're more, they're more interested in what I have to share with them less interested about me. Because if, if in Australia, one of the biggest things here, you, and, and this happens mostly around the world, is if you go on stage and you're not aware and, and everything you, you talk about on stage is me, 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 mm. uh, people switch off very quickly. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I don't know. I guess from a very high level, I just look at it as it, it really just depends on the context of the situation and your ability to adapt. Yep. Yeah. And I the think same just, thing can be said. <laughs> but perceived and I think differently. You, and, and just as you were saying that, like the difference between arrogance and confidence and what that actually looks like in a practical form is when I think about arrogance, I nearly feel like it's trying to cover up some type of insecurity or like there's nearly a deficiency there, right? Because yeah. I think when people are like, oh, that person's arrogant, mm. there's nearly like some sort of subconscious feeling that mm. are they overcompensating in this interaction or the way that they present? Yeah. themselves yep. because yeah either something's lacking or they're maybe just a little yeah. bit uncertain or, or yeah. don't know but because i also wonder from like a training and development perspective like how mm -hmm. do you turn it from arrogance into confidence because to me like when you say the word confident i'm like i feel like that's something where it's like a positive view of oneself where it's actually helping and you know, call it growing the pie of the interaction. Whereas if somebody's coming across as arrogant, it might be diminishing in whatever that, uh, that interaction is. But I think people are pretty clear, right? Like people have a generally a pretty good yeah, level of for, like a sensitivity to when somebody's yeah. being arrogant versus confident. You know, what's really interesting too. I think the trap that we fall into, let's say the trap is arrogance. We tend yeah. to fall into this trap earlier on in our journey, regardless of what that journey is, whether it's earlier on in life, in terms of the years you've been alive, or earlier on in your journey in whatever that craft is. Mm. 
you rarely find someone who's been doing something for the last 10, 20 years to be arrogant. Yeah. Right? It's the people who've just started doing something. It's like, mm. if I was to think back when I was the most arrogant as a magician, it was very <laughs> early on in my journey. It was very early on. It's when you just first learned a few moves and you're like, I am the shit, right? <laughs> right? And I think that's a trap that's early on. And a lot of people fall into it and stay in it. Yeah. But it's a trap that, that is set that's fairly early on in all of our journeys, regardless of what that path is that we're taking. Yeah. Because ultimately, the more you learn, it's the, it's the age-old wisdom, right? The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Mm. And humility hits you pretty hard because it's like even the world of communication. The more I learn about communication skills, the more I realize I don't know as well. I'm like, far out, there's so much to learn. And it humbles you. That, that wealth of knowledge humbles you. Whereas when you have very little knowledge, you think you're the shit because you go, I know everything there is to know because you don't know that there's actually a lot more you don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think, I I think arrogance is, thing. going back to an earlier theme that we spoke about, I think arrogance yeah. is when there's a really good disparate, like a discrepancy between IQ and EQ as well. Like you can yeah, see sure. some very, very intelligent people fall down the trap of, you know, arrogance after a couple of wins or whatever happen. Mm. Um, because that, that's the other thing as well is like, I think it also shifts, say from a performance perspective, where mm. if the results aren't matching the way that you're communicating your level of certainty and how you're betraying yourself. You know, like what you said earlier, like you were arrogant. You're like, I'm the shit when you were early on in the magic career. Now, when you were the shit, you didn't have to say that you were the shit anymore because you're like, all right, well now I'm pretty comfortable with the way that I'm executing. Like is maybe, is maybe arrogance also just a rite of passage, like call it fake until you make it until you do get to a level where it turns into. Well, I, I think it's a part of the journey. I think, I think we yeah. all are at some point in our lives arrogant. Yeah. At some point. And you might just for sure you know, have a little bit of arrogance. It might just be a little bit. It might, may not be full blown arrogance. It may just be little bits of arrogance. And I think we, we all go through it. I mean, life is just, you know, it's a sine wave. We've been through all of it. Right. And mm. the danger is, I think another perspective of arrogance as we're kind of exploring this from all different facets I think another perspective with arrogance is you're arrogant when you think you're better than other people. Mm. I think that that's a yeah, quite a that's core big. part of arrogance, right? I think a core part of arrogance is, and, and that's what happens when you're early on in your journey in life, age years, when you're early on in life, you think you're better than your parents. Mm. You think, man, mom doesn't know what she's talking about. I'm totally going to go bike riding without a helmet. I don't understand because I'm, I'm never going to fall off. I'm never going to get into a car accident because I, I drive. I'm the best driver there is. Yeah. And I think arrogance is a combination of you thinking you're better than other people while you have limited amounts of knowledge. So the less knowledge you have and the mindset of you thinking you're better than other people and you not having situational awareness, that is a disaster. Yeah. or arrogance. And that's why a lot of little kids are really arrogant as well because they've got limited knowledge, terrible self-awareness and no EQ. And yeah. then they think they're better than everybody else. <laughs> oh, you're so right. Like yeah. six-year-olds are very arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's like your son. When you asked one of your boys, I think it was, my, no, it was Romeo. You said, hey, yeah. what would happen if uh, an intruder came into the house and tried to rob yeah. us? And then uh, you know, Romeo's like, oh, easy. I just punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, okay, that's pretty arrogant. That's pretty, uh, yeah, that's not how it's going to go down. Yeah, he, he's battling with this because the other day, this, the same thing happened. Like, he's like, we were asking him, like, oh, something came around. It's like, what's your, what's your like skill or whatever, right? And he's like, oh, I'm strong. He's like, I'm stronger than everyone in the family, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, then, and then Marcel's like, Hey, look, mate, like if you think about it, he's like, you're small, I'm small, dad's small, mum's small. So he's like, and then Marcel's like, if I threw down right now, like if you and me fronted up and we were in a fight, he's like, I'm nine, you're six. He's like, I'd beat the crap out of you. <laughs> and then he's just like, ah, 
<laughs> so but, but did you see it. knowledge? So, the, the new knowledge humbled him. Right? I don't know if it did though. I, he was like, I think his next line was, you know, his next line was, nah, I'll just get you in a headlock yeah, and yeah, you would lose. So it's, I don't know. But yeah. Well, <laughs> well bless his heart because I find that cute. Yeah. It, it's no, cute. It's adorable. It's, it's cute. It's adorable. Until he adorable. gets punched in the face. Yeah, until he gets yeah. punched. <laughs> that, that's, that's what's interesting. I mean, as we were exploring this, I think it, it, it's cool to, to talk about all the different sides of arrogance, yeah. right? There's, there's, there's so many sides to it. And I think that the one we haven't, spoke about a lot is the whole you think you're better than other people yeah that one's and, big and just judgments in general yeah. like judgments are very like if you're with that mindset like i know better that person yeah. won't be able to do what i can do or never mm. will never be able to do what i could do yeah. um yeah all these different perspectives it's probably a good sign that it might not be confidence. Well, it might be. Well, it's, it might it's, be it's why I. It's why anytime I, and you know, it's funny because I've, I've been able to build a thick skin over the last nine years of creating content, and I, I'm glad that the virality of my content only started to happen now. It, it's weird to say that because I've always wanted to have a bigger audience, and and it's been painful at times not being able to build that audience, even though I was producing a lot of quality content. But I think the training in the last nine years is that it's helped me develop A, a really thick skin, um, B, also to understand as well that even when someone shares something hateful with you or, or they write something really mean, mm. it's that it's helped me understand that, look, the, I, I don't know what that person's going through in their lives. I don't know where they currently are in their life maybe they're in a world of pain, you know, to, to me, for someone to write something so incredibly hateful <laughs> for someone they don't even know. And yeah. the video is 14 seconds in length. <laughs> like it, it, it just means that this person, the is message is to... four minutes in length, but the video was 14 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. Or, or like, you know, whatever it was, but, but to, to, to yeah. get that worked up, leave <laughs> that much toxic, yeah. It just means that that person's going through a world of pain. Mm. You know, and, yeah. and, and I think that understanding that I have now has only been able to be developed as a result of me getting my arrogance under control. Because mm. if I got upset at that, I could have replied and been very arrogant and, and you know, start to lay it on that person and, and I, and I think I have the ability to do that. I mean, I could, I could be hateful, easy. I could be a smart ass and start leaving smart ass remarks. And, and that's what I started to do at the start of when I started to grow this big following. I started to be <laughs> arrogant back. I started yeah. to be like a smart ass back to them. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think it's only in, in having taken nine years to, to build this audience, mm -hmm. it's helped me mature a little more and and be less impulsive and then kind of reflected on some of the comments I left earlier on and go, Hey, Hey, is this what I want to do? Is this what I actually, is this the person I want to be? Not really. How am I standing in the line? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's just kind of, I, I see that now and just kind of think, ah, oh, man. It, yeah. You know, I feel and, for that, man. I mean, uh, there, was, there was a time when I left comments like that when I was younger, you know, when I was in the chat rooms of Yahoo and, and hated on people, it's just when you're not in a good place, well, I'll give yeah. credit where it's due, bro. Like I've seen you in environments where like you live in a world where it could be very easy to get ahead of yourself, right? And I'm talking this like even when you were relatively early mid-stage in the career, I've never seen you get into a position like one of the, whenever we have chats or anything, I've never had like ever felt in the position where it's like, hey man, I think you need to rein this back a little bit or you're getting ahead of yourself, which is actually quite incredible if you actually think about the stuff that you've done over that period of time, like, mm. like for those that don't know, like you will sit there, you'll perform in front of 15,000 people. And it's like, you're a rock star. Like people come up, they want photos, want all your time. They want all the attention. Like it would be so easy after that to be on a high and just be like, Hey, Craig, get us a drink. Like, you know, whatever, Ooh. whatever it is. Like, but you're just like, so like that was one of the things especially being on the road with you that i noticed where i'm like all right this is a 
pretty high quality individual that really understands himself is that straight after that was done, you just like a normal, just a normal dude, like a kid in tracky pants, we go and eat, you know, no, not talking about, you don't need like to talk about how good it was that you, what you just did and how many people came up and wanted autographs and selfies. Like, and that would have been understandable. Like even that level, it would have been like, yeah, that's fine. Like we should probably talk about that and like acknowledge that something pretty special happened, but that's never how you really operated. Like you just want to hang out with your friends and family and kind of do your thing, which I think is, I don't know, again, goes back to maybe your value set, how you're brought up, but it's something that I've always just, yeah, really admired about you that even when your following grew, right, it could have been pretty easy to now be like, all right, I've gone from 10,000 followers to 400,000 followers and you could change the way that you then operated. But yeah, yeah just from what I saw, like, again, it was humble. So, <laughs> So credit to you, bro. I think you, oh, even though you, you like outwardly project yeah. something that has to be confident yeah. and very confident, like internally, I think you do it. Like for those that know you very well, they probably don't see this side because they see what you share on, you know, on TikTok and on social media, which is always very inspiring and educational and motivational. But behind the scenes, you are by far one of the most um, yeah, humble people. That oh, I do. Thank you. And, and, and well, my question for you is then how, how are you so arrogant with such a small following? And, and <laughs> it's just, like, it's just, just, Hey, I'm still, I'm so early stage. Just got to fake it till I make it. <laughs> I've just never met anyone that uh, has no uh, reason to, to be arrogant, <laughs> but is so incredibly arrogant. And <laughs> someone who's just so egotistical and, Oh, Asking maniacal! Him, bring him drinks like, and yeah. like if I don't eat a couple of souls every day, it's a day lost. <laughs> oh, no, no, thanks, man. Yeah. No, thank yeah. you. I just had to balance out that beautiful moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I know it was too nice. There, yeah. yeah, we don't do that busy. usually, but no uh, props. No, no, but but dude, you know you're the same. Uh, it, it's it's just cool to be on the ride and on the journey with someone who both their feet are on the ground. You know, it's 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 dude. I mean, you've achieved some incredible things. And it's just amazing to see you ride your journey and still be so down to earth. You know, you, you, you just really, man, you inspire me to not get obsessed about the stuff and be more obsessed about the experiences we can create with the ones we love. You, you really help ground me in what's important, you know? And, and because again, <clears throat> like I, I appreciate the, the kind words, brother, but I will tell you that I am still so, drawn to things that are not good for me right i, I the, the pull of and again i'm happy to speak quite openly about this because the pull towards getting that nicer house getting that nicer car getting that nicer watch getting that nicer stuff it's always there man it's and it's not that it's natural for me to just go oh no i'm i'm enlightened i'm a zen man no no mm. shit it's, it's there and it's so strong and in my life, you are one of the forces that help make it easier, right? Because you're not drawn to those things. You're not drawn to the stuff. You're drawn to the experiences that you can create, the memorable moments, you know? And, and I think that's, that's so important. You're, you're such an important influence in my life. Yeah. Cheers, bro. Yeah. You're a very, very basic influence in my life. Like one of the lowest ones that... Yeah. I'm trying to do what you did before, but I can't really be bothered. It's it's wasn't as no, it wasn't as good. No, it wasn't as good. Sorry. It wasn't as good. It wasn't as good. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, no, man, look, I appreciate it. Props, I appreciate props it. For trying. Props for yeah, trying. No. Funny, but no, it would be no, no, no. I appreciate your kind well, words. Well, look, it's 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 nice being able to do one of these episodes every now and then. You know, it's it just whatever is kind of flowing through our minds, we get to speak our minds. It's, mm. it's kind of nice. It is, man. I like it. I, I don't, maybe the listeners enjoy it. Maybe the listeners don't, but <laughs> hey, we enjoyed it. <laughs> In the most arrogant way possible. We In the most don't arrogant really way care. possible. We were, go, we were going to do it anyway. So it's yeah, we're going to do it anyway. But look, <laughs> we had to we, catch up. So we thought we'd record it. And this is what. <laughs> hey, I, I think I, I would love to be able to, to reach out to our audience too. And, and if you're listening to this, we would love you to also recommend us what books you'd like us to review. Mm. You know, I think a lot of the times mm. we can be narrow-minded in the books that we choose and we may only be choosing books that we want to read. And I would love the audience to jump onto our social media. Uh, for Ali, it's at Ali Tarai, so at A-L-I-T-E-R-A-I. 
And for me, it's at Ask Vin. Uh, you're most likely already following me, not Ali, but do check Ali's social media <laughs> out. But again, seriously, we'd, we'd love you to send us a DM on a book that you, you, you would love us to review on our podcast or anything that you feel would benefit us. We, we, we would love to be able to look into that. Because again, you know, you, you know how we can get trapped only looking at certain books and not looking at books outside of your, your radar. I think it'd be nice to pick up something that's not on our radar. Yeah, for sure. Great call. All right. Well, look, everyone, thanks for joining us for the second ever chin wag we've ever done. We really appreciate you being on the journey with us. Thanks for joining us for the last two hours. Bye for now.